Amen. Well, that was well read for us. And that's exactly where we're going to be today in our text. It's good to see each of you here on this beautiful Palm Sunday, a day when we remember the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. This is a very important time in the life of Christ, and uh, some things have happened. And we're going to look at this uh, passage and hopefully, as Bible students, learn and not just learn, but also find the significance of this event in our own personal lives. Uh, there are only a few incidents in the life of Christ that actually show up in all the Gospels. Most of the Gospels record different types of events, or they give you different uh, angles of the same event. This is one of the few that it's the same. All four have the triumphal entry of Christ. And we celebrate this event year after year, but do we really understand the significance of Palm Sunday? Where does that really fit into our understanding of Jesus Christ? And more importantly, how do we apply it with significance into our life today? I hope and pray that the Lord will reveal to us how this can transform us as well. Now, what made the event significant in that day is that Jesus was being acknowledged by the people who gathered. And as the long-awaited king of the Jews, he would save his people. This is also Jesus going public. He's been in a season that we've been studying. And of course, we studied last week. Ralph did a tremendous job bringing to us chapter 19. But we've been um, from chapter 14 through 19 looking at Jesus who has retreated. He is actually pulled back and he's focused on his disciples because the resistance took place where the Jews and the scribes and the the uh, religious leaders were questioning him about everything. So in resistance, he pulls back into a retreat. Well, guess what? Things were about to change here in our text. You'll notice we've jumped ahead. Don't let that bother you. We will go back and we'll complete chapter 18 uh, after Easter, and then we'll cover chapter 20, and then we'll cover the remainder of chapter 21. We're not going to work through the whole thing today. I just wanted this to focus and take advantage of Palm Sunday, and we see it right here before us. Now, this, this event, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, riding on a foal, listen, this was prophesied 500 years earlier. So 2,500 years ago, Zechariah, he said in chapter 9, verse 9, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, look, behold, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, it was a Jewish custom that king's royalty had been known to ride in on a donkey. This was a tradition, this was a custom among the Hebrews, and it was given to royalty. And so if only the crowd was celebrating for the same reason that God is celebrating his son coming into Jerusalem. They saw him as a king, and he saw himself as the king, but their king was a different king than what he came to be. It's interesting that he's coming into his capital city with salvation and deliverance, but it's not the same salvation and deliverance that the people are asking of him. They want physical salvation. They're not looking for spiritual salvation. They're not concerned about the sins in their heart. They're more concerned about the Romans who have occupied Jerusalem. They've come in and now they have control. And they've even built the fortress of Antonio, which was built just outside the northwest wall of the temple. So that that's where they garrisoned, that's where they quartered their Roman soldiers. And, and so the Jews are like, we want the Romans out of here. Thank the Lord, the King, the Messiah has come to deliver us from the Romans. This was their heart cry. They want him to live in a palace and rule with power and might. Jesus is coming to establish a spiritual temple in the hearts of those who believe. It's not about physical it's about the spiritual life of every person. 
His kingdom will not be defined by the physical brick and mortar. It's going to be a spiritual kingdom that no physical kingdom can destroy. The Romans can't get to the kingdom that Jesus is establishing. We've been studying about Jesus for a long time now in Matthew, since September, and we're seeing that he truly is the king, but his kingdom is not of this world. He came to establish a different kingdom. And as the weeks or as the week wore on for the people who gathered and praised him on Sunday, all but a few faithful followers will abandon Jesus, the king by the end of the week. But on this day, the first day of the final week of his physical life, he receives praise from the people because he alone deserves their praise. What our Savior has already gone through to come with the message of the gospel and share and heal and and, uh, help people recover from blindness. He's done so many things for the people and he deserves the praise as a king. But no longer does he tell his disciples to remain silent about him. Now he comes out in public, riding on a donkey, a custom of royalty, saying to the people, I am your king. It's just that you don't understand the kingdom that I'm coming with. And I wonder if sometimes we as Christians also get confused over the kingdom of God. And we think that somehow what is right for the kingdom of God is that America be in the hands of people who are God-fearing. Well, that would be nice. That would be wonderful. But that's not God's kingdom. America is not God's kingdom. God doesn't love America more than he loves our brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling in uh, Muslim Islamic terrorist countries. He loves us all the same. We're all his children. His kingdom is not of this world. It's not something we can lay our hands to. But it is a kingdom that resides in the heart of every true believer all over the globe. That's our king. That's our kingdom. And at this point, he makes that public. The spreading of cloaks and branches was an act of homage for royalty. Jesus is openly declaring to the people that he is the long-awaited Messiah. The people knew that. They knew he was different. They knew he was going to set them free. That's why they were all screaming out, Hosanna. We've been following in our text from day one, back in chapter one through uh, chapter, um, from one to chapter 10, we, we looked at the king revealed. And then from chapters 11 through 13, we saw the king resisted as the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders resisted the message of Christ. And then in chapters 14 through 20, which we're still in, we see the king retreating, focused privately on his own people, giving them instruction before he leaves. And then in chapter 21 through 27, so this would be the first chapter of almost the entire final section of of this gospel. And here we see the king rejected. So he goes public. He's letting them know, I am your Messiah. But he's also, he knows this is the beginning of tremendous rejection. We've all faced rejection to some degree. Some of you have faced great rejection. But none of us have faced the ultimate rejection. The ultimate rejection will happen when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and he pronounces who is entering the kingdom of heaven and who is going to hell. And there are many people who believe that they are going to heaven. Jesus said that. That's not my opinion. Jesus said there's a way that's narrow that leads to life and few there are that find it. And there's a way that's wide, and it leads to death. And many will find it. And Jesus wasn't saying that this path has a sign. The little path says heaven, and the other path says hell. If it did, nobody would go down the path. That path also, people think they're going to heaven. 
That will be an ultimate rejection from God himself on the day of the Lord. I don't wish that upon any human being. And what that does when I think about it is it compels me to want to share the gospel with everybody and never stop believing, never stop believing that your lost friend, your lost family member can be saved. Don't ever lose hope. Don't ever quit on them. Always continue to pray that the light will come on and they'll see the glorious grace of God for what it is and the mercy of God will embrace them and love them and lavish on them God's wonderful love. Don't ever, don't ever lose sight of that. So here we are at the beginning of a different section in Matthew's gospel and we see now that it's all about the king rejected. Let's pick up at verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, Bethphage would be located less than a mile just outside the east wall of the Temple Mount. Inside the Temple Mount is actually the temple. Okay, and so back in, when Jesus was there, the temple still stood. It wasn't long after that the temple was completely decimated by the Romans. But right now in their story, Jesus, the temple is there. And so they, it was out not quite as far uh, well, it's actually Bethphage is just beyond the Mount of Olives. So less than a mile outside the eastern wall of the Temple Mount. And, and, and then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. Now, that is interesting to me, that phrase, the Lord needs them. That's a, that seems like a complete contradiction, doesn't it? When does the Lord need anything? But it's written in a way that we can understand and a way that that person who had that, colt, that donkey and that little foal would understand it. And so, of course, uh, the city of Jerusalem was teeming with people at this time. This would have been upwards of about 2 million people in Jerusalem at the same time. The Jews had gathered from all regions to commemorate what? The Feast of Passover. The Feast of Passover. One of the seven major Jewish feasts. And as a side note, just so that, write this down if you will, but there are seven major Jewish feasts. And listen, each one of them is unique and important. Every single one of the seven feasts are important. Why? Because each one symbolizes a different aspect of the life, the death, or the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You'll find Christ in all seven of the feasts of the Jews. This particular feast, the Feast of Passover, served as a reminder of how God would deliver his people from bondage in Egypt some 1,500 years earlier. Okay? And so they've all gathered. It was appointed that every Jewish male, uh, every man would go to Jerusalem. Most of them would bring their families. And this huge celebration of a feast that lasted the whole week. And I mean great shouting. So on the first day of the feast, Jesus comes in and the people have the palms and the cloaks. And they're laying them down and they're praising and they're worshiping. Hosanna, Hosanna, they're singing. And, and what a beautiful sight that must have been. But I want you to remember something else about this wonderful Passover feast. I want you to remember that it was Moses that God sent to set Israel free from bondage in Egypt. Egypt is always seen in the Bible as a type of sin. It's a place of bondage. And that's what sin does to us. It puts us in bondage. The Red Sea, the folding back of the waters and crossing over, a miracle that God's people could cross over the Red Sea and then it would close in on Pharaoh's army and drown them. That's a picture of your salvation. And coming into the promised land, oh my, coming into the promised land, that's where you and I will be with God for eternity. Amen? In his promised land. And I'm so thankful that God loves us that much that he provided that. He provided the way out of bondage, 
He provided the salvation. The people did nothing except cross over. God did the work, and he provides the promised land for us. And I'm thankful. It's important to note that Jesus gave precise instructions for attaining this donkey. And, and, and that's because everything that happens during Passover week, from this Sunday until next, everything is exactly as God the Father orders up. From the course of Sunday to Sunday, when Jesus rises from the dead, the experience of, the, of Jesus being hauled away in the middle of the night and put through a fake trial, the, the fact that Jesus is beaten until he's unrecognizable. This is before he even goes to the cross. The fact that he will go to the cross and he will suffer and the Father will forsake him on the cross. Every single aspect, the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, every single point, every single person involved in this huge passion drama is exactly as God the Father planned. Even Judas giving his kiss in the garden so the soldiers could take Jesus away exactly as God the Father laid out. And in fact, many things, many parts of this week are actually recorded in the Old Testament hundreds of years earlier. I guess the point that I'm making for you right now is you have a Father in heaven who has never been surprised by anything that's happened in your life. And some of you are thinking, well, some of the things that happened weren't fair. How could he allow that? Why did he let that happen? Because you live in a sin-sick world, and the Father has given you the ability to choose. And we have to come through this world. It's a world of pain and suffering. God's not holding back. He's not going to take back. He can't. If God were to wink at sin or look the other way or remove us from this world without the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, he's not really God. Because now he's not holy. The only way that we can possibly have the forgiveness of sins, the only way that we can be healed, the only way that we can make it through the trials and the temptations of this world is by clinging to the Christ who went to the cross, listen, and suffered as we have suffered, but in much greater measure. And he went through death that we will one day face. He's already been there. But thanks be unto God that three days later, up from the grave, he arose. We're going to celebrate that next week. And because he lives, listen, in this world of trial and tribulation, you and I both can live in him. If he can endure, we can endure. The key is keeping our eyes on Jesus. Never take your eyes off of the Lord. Always go through every thing you face in life with your eyes clearly firmly on Jesus Christ what I think is beautiful even if you think and you talk about and think about God's sovereign plan here through the week through the entire week no surprises it was the preparation of God that carried out every event in the Bible regarding Passover week and I think what's fascinating is it and this is a picture this picture of Christ going to the cross is a picture of the Passover feast itself here the Jews are celebrating the Passover feast, how God provided for them a way of escape from bondage in Egypt. And here Christ is about to go to the cross and provide once for all deliverance from sin, where the power of sin is broken, where the penalty of sin has been completely annihilated through his own shed blood on the cross. Amen? Remember what happened? Heart, uh, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and God caused 10 different plagues to come to Egypt. The 10th plague was that there would be death from the firstborn in every single house in Egypt. Well, the Jews were living in Egypt. 
They didn't want to lose their firstborn, and God didn't either. God had a plan. He had a preparation. And he told the Jews that you're going to have to take the most precious of all your animals, whatever little lamb you have, and you bring it into your house and you let it live in your house for a week. Now what's going to happen if you go out today and find a little ewe lamb and you bring it home to your children and let it live in the, live in the house for a week? What's going to happen? It's called a pet. That lamb ain't going nowhere. That's what God did to his people. He wanted them to become endeared to the lamb. And then he told the father, you take your son outside and you say, son, this little lamb that we've come so close to, it is appointed, God said, that the firstborn should die. You're supposed to die. God's going to sacrifice you unless there's another way. And God has given us this little lamb that's without blemish, that did nothing wrong, it's innocent. And that little lamb has to die so that you can live. And those little boys and girls saw that little pet, the life flow out of it. And then the blood was taken and it was put over the top of the door on the sides of the door, on the floor, the threshold. A picture of what's to come. Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. The final picture of sacrifice. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. This took place, verse 4, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now, what's interesting there, that's a, that's a very wordy sentence about Jesus riding on a donkey. But if you understand it, it was actually a donkey and her foal. And he was riding on the little foal. That foal had never been ridden before. But because the foal's mother is in front of her, she's taking him, following. And Jesus is riding on the foal, as it was prophesied by Zechariah 500 years earlier. When the Roman soldiers stationed in Jerusalem, and they were all over the city, during, especially during the Feast of Passover, you better know that they were there. They made it very clear. And so while they're walking around uh, showing their occupation of that city, you can just imagine what they thought when they saw a man riding on a donkey coming into town and people praising him. They had to snicker. They had to laugh. Whenever a Roman commander or a Roman leader would come into Rome, they would go down the road of triumph. And as they would come down that road, they were riding in a chariot pulled by black horses. And behind the chariot, you'd find thousands of soldiers marching in step with shields gleaming. This was their picture of triumph. Look at these silly Jews and their picture of triumph. A man riding on a donkey. But this is a different type of triumph. This is not a triumph of pride and worldly pleasure. This is a triumph of humility. Jesus, through his humility, has overcome pride and worldly splendor. It's his poverty that has triumphed over affluence. It's his meekness and gentleness that has triumphed over the rage and the hatred that's in the world. Today, pride, worldly splendor, affluence, and hatred are praiseworthy in this world, depending on the group that you represent. But as followers of Christ, we're not called to get caught up in that whole world. Listen, 
We're called to walk differently. We're called to walk by the Spirit in humility, godly stewardship, meekness, and gentleness. And like our Savior before us, we too will be scoffed at and snickered at by the world. But the cancel culture cannot change what Christ has ordained for his people. It can't. It just can't. Listen, Christian, a day is coming. It's called the day of the Lord. When our Savior will return and he won't be riding a donkey this time. And he, when he comes, the world will no longer mock and scoff at him. Instead, they'll be quaking with a holy dread as they see the king coming in his glory. You may wonder, well, what will that look like? You don't need to wonder. God showed uh, John on the Isle of Patmos in a vision exactly what it's going to look like when our Lord returns. Let me read it for you. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened. The sky's going to split open, folks. And behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. He came in humility the first time. He's coming to make war the next time. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he, was, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. The one thing that the world disrespects, the one thing that the world laughs at as we quote Scripture, the one thing that they think we're Neanderthal because we follow that archaic book, but our Savior's returning, and His name is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following Him on white horses, and from His mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. I do not believe that that was actually a literal sword sticking out of his mouth. That's John trying to explain that as he came and he spoke, his words were sharp like a sword. They did, they did their work on the earth and stri to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread. This is not a joyous return. We should celebrate today on Palm Sunday the triumphal entry of our Lord. We know why did we celebrate that because King Jesus has coming into Jerusalem making public his spiritual kingdom that he's establishing, that he's going to deliver the people from sin. You and I have been delivered from sin, amen? amen. But on that day when he returns, the next time, the second coming, he will tread the winepress of the fury of of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When the word of God appears and strikes down the nations with the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, rest assured, Christian, every living soul will know that he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Nobody will mistake it then. Every unrepentant sinner will come into immediate awareness that the message of the gospel was in fact true and they rejected the one true and living God. People might cast off Christ as just another religious figure today, but when the sky splits open and Jesus appears with eyes like fire and a voice like rushing waters, they will experience the ultimate rejection from the one who claimed to be the only way, the only truth, and the only life. You see, the first time Jesus came, he came as the suffering servant. This time, when he comes back, he's the conquering king. Every Christian should be consumed with Philippians chapter 2. Turn there, please. I want you to go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Every Christian should... Commit this to memory. Every Christian should live out this passage of Scripture. You want this to be your life. It is your life. The Apostle Paul says that have in verse 5, Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves. In other words, 
set your mind to this. Make this the way you think. Let this be your belief system. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You can't have this mindset if you're not in Christ, if you're not a believer. If you're here today and you're not a believer, you're reading about what could be if you believe. And I sure pray that you would believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. He says, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He's speaking of Jesus when he came to earth. But emptied himself. See, there's no power play here by Christ. By taking the form of what? A servant. When he came, he didn't come to conquer. He came to be a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself. The Bible tells us, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due season he will lift you up. You're not supposed to wait for somebody to humble you. You're not supposed to wait for a crisis to humble you. You're not supposed to ask God to humble you. You don't want to ask God to humble you. you he, God says, no, go ahead and humble yourself. Jesus did it. You think you're too good for that, to humble yourself? Jesus did it. God humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here it is. Listen, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever follow another name on this earth. Don't ever put your life in the hands of another person so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. Every. Every tongue will confess. Eminem, Jay-Z, and Tupac will regret every filthy word that they ever sang in a rap song if they don't repent and come to Jesus. And some of them have already gone. Oprah, Dr. Phil, Tony Robbins, from the Dalai Lama to Mahatma Gandhi to Deepak Chopra, from Ernest Hemingway to J.K. Rowling, from Stephen Hawking to Richard Dawkins, every president that has ever ruled, every king that has ever sat, every actor that has ever been celebrated, every politician that has ever lied, every business person that has ever manipulated, every scientist that has ever denied the truth, every atheist that has ever denied God, every local hero, every town drunk, every innocent man or woman to every evil, maniacal sinner, all will bow down before the one true living God. And we celebrate Palm Sunday because God's let us in on this. He's revealed it to us. He's come into us. He lives in us. We don't have to do anything on a physical level to worship God. It's spiritual. God is spirit, and he's to be worshiped in spirit and truth. That's why in a church like Vero Bible Fellowship, we don't have to have the can lights, the moving lights. We don't have to have the smoke machine. And look, those things are part of a theatrical setting. That's what they were created for, right? They didn't start in churches. They use them in theatrical settings first. But many churches have adapted to those things. And I suppose if you're doing a theatrical event in the life of the church uh, regarding uh, something out of the Bible, a story from the Bible, there's not a thing wrong with it. But don't let those things become what makes you feel like worshiping. God, help us. You should be able to go into your closet in your home, fall on your knees before God and open his holy word and begin to worship him and cry and feel because you know the truth. And as you think about the truth that you're speaking or that you're reading or that you're singing, it moves you. It's not the stuff on the outside that moves me. It's what I know inside that moves me. Does that make sense? 
That's the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of God. We mark this day as significant when, behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And verse 6, back in our text, and the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and put on, on, them, on, and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna! To the son of David, there they are, recognizing, the Jews recognizing he's in the bloodline of royalty, David, the greatest king to ever sit on the throne of Israel. And they're putting Jesus in that bloodline, rightfully so. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. What a glorious sight that must have been. Hosanna means save now. They're crying out, save us now! As Jesus, the Messiah, is riding in on a donkey. But what the crowd meant by save and what Christ meant are two completely different things. The crowd was essentially saying, overthrow the Roman political machine. Help us economically. Lead us militarily. Save us now. No wonder as the week wore on, the crowd dissipated as they realized that the plans of God the Father carried out by God the Son were far different than what they wanted. Is it any different today? Many people claim to be Christians because They've been taught, unfortunately, that Jesus is their good luck charm. That's why they go to church. That's why they're Christians. They follow preachers who tickle the ear with false prophecies and sensual sayings. Your best is yet to come. Jesus is going to increase your finances. Jesus is going to make your name great in the city. He's going to advance your position at work. Their message is, it's all about you. Those that have joined that train are going to be sorely disappointed when they discover that they've been deceived into following after their own prideful, selfish, sensual desires. They never picked up a cross to follow Jesus. They've never denied themselves for his name's sake. They see meekness as defeat. They see weakness as sin. They really don't know the Jesus of the Bible. And that ought to break our hearts for them. We're not to laugh at them. We're not to make fun of them. We're to pity them. And we're to try and reach them with the truth about Jesus. Jesus never came to make us successful. He came to save us. From ourselves, not make us better selves. He came to die for our sin and pay the price for our iniquity. And if he never blesses us beyond our salvation in this life, we have received far more than any of us ever deserve. Amen? That should be more than enough to merit our loyalty, our affection, and our eternal devotion. The fact that Jesus paid the price in full. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when he entered Jerusalem, verse 10, the whole city was stirred up. That word stir there in the Greek is steo, or I'm sorry, seo, which is where we get our word seismic. So when he came through the city riding on a donkey, literally, not a physical earthquake, but emotionally and, and, and mentally, people were shaken by his entry. I think that's pretty awesome. 
And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all, the, all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. By the way, this is the second time that Jesus enters the temple and drives out the money changers. It happened at the beginning of his ministry and now towards the end of his ministry. He comes into the Passover feast, the first day, people everywhere, millions of people, and he goes straight forth. You know good and well that those Jews who were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now, they thought for sure he was making his way straight to the garrison where the Romans were quartered. And he's going to go in there and he's going to clean house. And he didn't. You know what he did? He made his way, a beeline, straight for the temple to deal with the Jews, not the Romans. Because he never came to establish an earthly kingdom. He came to set men free from their sin debt. He came to fulfill his father's will. So instead, heading to, instead of heading for the Romans, he heads to the temple. And what was happening in the temple was the people there were coming, entering the gate, the outer outer gate, and they would come with their little pigeon or their little turtle dove, those who were poor, couldn't afford a lamb, and they would come. They had traveled, you know, many had traveled hundreds of miles coming for the great feast, and they wanted to go into the temple and make sacrifice to God. So they'd bring a little turtle dove that they purchased just outside the temple in the marketplace. But when they came into the temple, the priest and those who worked for the priest, they would stop the people as they were going to make sacrifice and say, I need to look at your animal. Oh, no, that would never, God would never receive that as a sacrifice. That is a blemished animal. And then they'd say, now go over to this table and we have turtle doves and pigeons for you. And they would, they would charge 20 times the amount that the people were paying outside. So what were they essentially doing? Here it is. They were hindering people from worshiping God. And Jesus became righteously indignant. And he said, enough of this. We too have a temple that needs cleansing. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? The Lord needs to come and overturn the tables in our lives too, folks. You say, well, he already did that. Well, guess what? He's going to do it again and again and again because there's junk in the temple. And it's junk that we placed in the temple of God. And God, by the Holy Spirit who lives in us, is not going to allow that to happen without speaking to it. Many of us need to fall on our face before God and repent for our sins because God is wanting to dwell a pure vessel. I'm not talking about perfect vessel. We'll all fall short, and the grace of God covers past, present, and future sins. But God, in our fellowship with God, he wants purity. He wants us walking in purity. And so it's okay. It's nothing wrong with us allowing God to take out the trash. Amen? Stop long enough to consider that God needs to take out some trash in your life. 1 Peter 2, 4, and 5 says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up. See, you're continually changing, transforming, conforming to Christ. You're being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. There it is. God wants your house to be a holy place, to offer spiritual sacrifices, not physical animal sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Let me tell you four characteristics of a a body, a temple, that is, that God can use. Let me tell you corporately what a church body should look like based on Scripture. Look here. First of all, write it down. Our church is to be a house of prayer. You personally, your temple should be a place of prayer. We see that in verse 13. Look, he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. 
There ought to be a time in your life when you just get on your face before God on a regular basis and seek the Lord while he may be found. See, a healthy Christian is marked by a strong prayer life. A person who prays is one who recognizes that he is utterly dependent upon God for everything in his life. He doesn't provide anything. A person who doesn't pray is making a declaration of independence from God. Who wants that? I don't want to make that declaration. Everything we do must be saturated as a church in prayer. A healthy, strong church prays. Otherwise, how will we know what the Lord is doing? And how will we join him in it? If we're not praying, we must always pray. Secondly, our church is to be a place where people experience spiritual sight and healing. Verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the, in the temple, and he healed them. Each of us was spiritually blind. Each of us was, if, forgive me, lame-brained before Christ. We didn't know better. We thought we did. Our pride fooled us, didn't it? But we were lame-brained. And Christ comes and he brings us through the teaching of the word of God in the church Strong teaching must occur. I, 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 I think it's important that we preach and teach from the Bible. I believe it's important that you open your Bible and we teach the Bible. That we follow along. Because otherwise, when will you open it? Some of you are not opening the Bible at all except when you come to church. And that's unacceptable to God. That is not a spiritual act of service to God. That is a disservice to God. We should be opening our Bible every day, every week. But certainly when we come to church as a pastor, as a shepherd, amongst the other shepherds of our flock, we want to see you opening your Bible. We don't care to put everything up on the screen so you can just sit there like this. You mouth breather. <laughs> Seriously, though, be in the Word of God you do know who's returning. His name is the Word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but His Word will stand forever. Get in it. Get on that train. Each of us needs that. That's how we come out of spiritual darkness. That's how we, we come out of blindness. That's how we are made whole and healthy after being lame from our sin and sickness. Number three, our church is to be a place where we join God in his wonderful work. Look what it says in verse 15, but when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, oh, that should be the church. People should see the wonderful things that Christ is doing in the life of his church. This is our mission, to join God in his work. And by the way, it's not us working it's the Holy Spirit in us who equips us to join God in his work. So we can't, even claim, we can't even claim credit for the work. You say, but it was my hands. It was the Holy Spirit who put the compelling in your heart to use your hands for God. Otherwise, if the Spirit didn't compel you, you'd use them hands for nobody but you all day long, every day. But see, it's the Lord. And in just a few weeks... I'm so excited. We're going to be celebrating the fruits of the work of God at Bureau Bible Fellowship when we baptize a large group of young people who have made Jesus Christ their Savior, who are proclaiming Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. Amen? We're going to make that part of the service. And number four, our church is to be a place where all ages worship the Lord. All ages. Worship is the paramount point of this church. Worshiping God. Nothing else. No one else. And we want all ages to participate. Look at verse 15. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, the children were crying, Hosanna to the son of David. The, 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 these guys became indignant. And they said to Jesus, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared, prepared praise. 
as Ralph read for us that beautiful passage this morning from the Bible, everything praises the Lord. Even inanimate objects praise the Lord. Not just things that have breath, but amongst those who have breath, even babies and infants. When we hear a little baby crying, we should say, praise God! There's life in this place. That's the life of God in that child. Amen. We should believe for the best of every child in our church, for the best of every young person in our church, for the best of every young couple in our church, for the best of the older single adults of our church, for the best of older married couples in our church, for the best of those who are retired and alone, widows and widowers. We should expect and believe for the best in their life, and we should see them as people who are created by God to praise Him throughout their life, through every stage of life. Don't ever lose that. That's who we are in Christ. Let me just say something about praise as we close here, okay? Let me give you four words in the Bible, Hebrew words that regard praise, okay? First of all, halal, H-A-L-A-L, halal, H-A-L-A-L. It's an Old Testament Hebrew word for praise. It literally means to acclaim or to glory in God who brings the deepest satisfaction, I love that. Late at night when you think you're hungry, still, still wanting to eat, you know, and instead of making yourself a peanut butter and pickle sandwich, why don't you lock yourself in your closet and let a little halal out? Amen? <laughs> let a little, listen, let him, let him, let his glory be what satisfies you deeply. Amen. Number two, Tauda, T O W D as in dog, A-H, Tauda. It means acknowledging and commending God's work and his character. To acknowledge and commend God's work and his character. Don't ever stop with Tauda. Listen to the minor prophet Micah as he brings Tauda before God. Listen, he says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. If you can't tout off of that, you don't know what praise is. Amen? Thirdly, and by the way, homework assignment. Let me give you one. You go home this week and you, you tauda all week long Psalm 50. Psalm 50. You just let that just seek into your cranium and watch what God does. It'll move it from your head down to your heart and you'll find your whole being transformed by tauda. Thirdly, barak, B-A-R-A-K. It means to kneel down, to bless God as an act of adoration, to salute God. To kneel down, to bless God as an act of adoration, to salute God. Psalm 95, uh, verse 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel. There it is, Barak. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. It would do all of us good to get on our knees before God. You say, well, I can't any longer, Pastor. That's okay. Then sit down. Sit. Do what you got to do. Get to a position where it shows that you are his subject, and you are worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Again, to bless God as an act of adoration. And then the last, there's, there's many more words for praise in the Bible, but the last one I'll speak of is Shabbat, S-H-A-B-A-C-H, Shabbat. And it means to shout, to address in a loud tone, to command, to triumph, let me give you one. Psalm 47, verse 1. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. When it says shout, it's saying Shabbat to God with loud songs of joy. There's nothing wrong with a believer who is sedate most of the time and who never really shows their emotions. There ain't nothing wrong with you just letting out a shout to the Lord sometime. You watch what that does to you, to let out a shout unto God. When you're driving in your car and you come over this thought of the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, some song on the radio, a Christian song that moves your heart, give him a shout! Hallelujah. 
in your car. Roll the windows down before you do it. <laughs> Let the world know who your God is. Amen? Amen. It's okay in church to give a shout. It's right here in the Bible. Somebody looks at you when you give a shout. They look at you funny like, what's wrong with you? You say, I'm just Shabbat and God. Deal with it. I'm having a Shabbat moment. Forgive me for my Shabbat moment. I was at a worship setting at a church in Texas one time, and uh, there was about 10,000 people in that place. And, and, and the Cruz family was singing. They, they, beautiful harmony. And they were singing, man. And I mean, they were lifting the roof on that place. And I, some little lady behind me was, woo! I mean, she let it out. I turned around. She goes, please forgive me for my worship. Please forgive me. She wasn't wanting to offend me, you know, but she couldn't hold it in. And I thought, bless God. That, that blessed my heart. It ought to bless us to hear every once in a while somebody let out a shout to God. Amen? Don't look around like, well, what was that? You learn today what it is right here in the Bible. Now, if somebody becomes belligerent with it and they're interrupting and confusing the service, then we're going to stop that nonsense because everything that God does is orderly, right? Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't cause confusion. He brings clarity where there's confusion. But I'll tell you right now, there's not a thing wrong with us giving a clap unto God or a shout to God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. We need to stop there. That's as far as we're going to go into chapter 21. We'll cover the rest of it when we get there in a few weeks. But I want us to just take a moment now out of reverence to God in awe of who he is. And let's thank him for what this day represents in the Bible and should mean to us even today that our Savior is the King. And he didn't come to set up an earthly kingdom. My Savior's kingdom is much bigger than that. My Savior has called me to live in this world, a fallen world, as a subject of his kingdom. And I will walk in his righteousness and in his peace and in his joy on this day, Palm Sunday. And I will carry it with me tomorrow as I face others in this world who don't know him. Because one day he's going to return and he'll no longer be the suffering servant. He will be the conquering king and it will be too late for them to know him as their savior they'll recognize him it'll be the ultimate rejection we don't want that church for anybody let's be a loving people let's carry out the great commandment let's love god with all of our heart soul mind and strength and love others as ourself and then let's fulfill the great commission let's go into the world let's share the gospel of jesus christ so that people can come to know Christ as we have. Amen? Amen? Father, this morning, we just take a moment for reflection to look internally. It's a beautiful thing for a husband and a wife to worship together, and we have folks that are doing that right now. It's also a beautiful thing to see a person who's sitting alone, but right now they are embraced, enveloped, by your loving arms and as they worship you lord may they begin to remember who you are and why you enter jerusalem triumphantly and we thank you lord for this we thank you for the revelation of this we thank you that today we can celebrate the king of kings and the lord of lords and one day know that every human being will know it. But Father, we pray that you just compel us to share it with others. May we share it with others, this wonderful revelation. May we care deeply about people, even strangers. May we care deeply enough to share with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, friends, uh, we have altar... Uh, ministers, people who come and pray with you. We have elders who will be up front. They're already gathering. If you have any request in your life that you'd like someone to join you in prayer, they're here for that. They will agree with you in prayer over whatever matter uh, you're facing in life. And let me also just remind you that in the back we have those cards. I mean, we're look, 
We're to share the gospel. Next Sunday's Easter. We're going to come with a powerful message on the resurrection of Christ and what it means for us. You want to bring your lost friends next week. And in the back, we have little invitations. There's stacks of them. Take as many as you'll pass out this week. Everywhere you go, just give them out. Let's, we don't advertise. We don't do any advertising. It's all word of mouth. That's all that VBF is. And so let's do what we can to share with others who Christ is. Amen? God bless you, church. Stay as long as you'd like if you want to just sit and focus on, uh, on yourself and the Lord. Or if you want to come forward, come up and meet with the folks. We're here for you. God bless you, church family.